Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And if you're a fan of NPR Radio, National Public Radio, you probably know about one of NPR's most popular flagship programs, the Peabody Award-winning All Things Considered. Heard for two hours every day, nationwide, even worldwide, featuring news, commentaries, interviews, special features. And for more than 30 years, All Things Considered was co-hosted by one of this country's most highly respected award-winning radio journalists, the incomparable Robert Siegel. Robert was not only the co-host of All Things Considered, he also served as the director of NPR's News and Information Department and was responsible for the production of two of NPR's leading programs, All Things Considered and Morning Edition. And he created NPR's Weekend Edition. Among the many awards Robert has been honored with is the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism, presented to him by the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, which he had attended after attending Columbia College. And now, Robert Siegel hosts his own television series seen right here monthly on JBS, entitled Navigating the New Abnormal, which is a production of the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. And in that program, Robert hosts a panel of outstanding guests who discuss issues of importance, especially now during this COVID pandemic. And then in journalistic integrity, there's one more thing to say about Robert Siegel. As a student at Columbia College, Robert Siegel got his start in radio at WKCR FM, which is the Columbia College radio station that is broadcast to the entire tri-state New York area. And at the same time Robert Siegel was at WKCR, so was I. Mm -hmm. I was a year ahead of Robert, he had the opportunity to serve as general manager of the station in my senior year. Robert and I knew each other. And having him on JBS now is not only a huge kick for me because of what he's accomplished in his own career as one of this nation's leading broadcast journalists. It's like reuniting with an old friend. And Robert, I watched your own career blossom Mm -hmm. into the extraordinary contribution you've made for more than 30 years at, AP, at NPR. And I am so proud that you are now part of JBS. Thank you, my friend. And thank you for joining me on L'Chaim. Well, Mark, thank you for inviting me to appear on L'Chaim. And I'm, I'm very proud uh, that navigating the new abnormal is, is, on, is on JBS. Uh, it's, uh, this is a, a, a labor in, of... Uh, uh, in, uh, all of my retirement, uh, my my hardworking days are over. But uh, I, you know, as I like to say, I, I do several things now in which I'm, 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 I work for Hanukkah Gelt at this stage. I understand. Um, you're giving back, but by the way, you're involved in a number of, you know, Jewish things right now, right, Robert? Yeah, I've had a surprisingly Jewish retirement. Uh, some a few years before I retired, uh, I began emceeing the Moment Magazine annual gala. Moment is a magazine that uh, Elie Wiesel famously was one of the uh, founders of. And um, I knew many people associated with it and was asked to do this. When I retired, that, that evolved into my becoming a contributor, a literary contributor. I interview authors and uh, write reviews and essays. Um, and uh, actually I won, 
uh, I won an award for commentary and criticism in Moment uh, this year, which, which was very gratifying because um, unlike a, a lot of awards I'd run in recent years, it wasn't for lifetime achievement, which always have a certain obituary-like feel to them. Uh, uh, this was actually for work that I had just done uh, and essays that I had written. Uh, so I, I, I was very satisfied with that. And uh, between the American Friends of the Rabin Medical Center, Moment Magazine, and uh, Congregation Bethel of Northern Virginia, where I, I uh, host any number of panels about uh, uh, books and current events, which my my, my shul. Um, I, yeah, I have I've, I'm experiencing a very um, a very Jewish retirement. In another in another equally important dimension, Rabbi Golub. Um, that I found last spring, as the uh, the pandemic had really intensified a, an odd uh, disorientation that began with retirement for me, which was the um, the lack of uh, of a rhythm to the days. You know, the the days all felt the same. I um, I felt a need, which uh, I, I remember it it it. Um, it was connected to me with a book I read many years ago called The Seven Day Circle, um, in which um, the author Z Zerubbabel, an Israeli, had pointed out that um, while the year, the month, and the day are astronomical time periods that people simply identified and named, the week and the notion of a, different, a difference between one day and the other days is, 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 was a revolutionary uh, a concept. And I felt I needed that, um, that rhythm to the week and became a regular Zoom service goer. So for, I think there've been a couple of periods in my life only, uh, this is the third one I'd say, when I've been a regular uh, Shabbat attending congregational member, not a backbencher and not, a, not an eight time a year attending, but every Saturday morning. And I've, I've, found, uh, I've found Zoom services to be, um, to be very, <laughs> very engaging. I can't, I can't explain why, but I did feel, I, I did feel the great need to, um, to define the, uh, the passage of time a bit better than, uh, than one does when there isn't a, a, a work day or, or a regular social appointments to, um, to give us that kind of definition. That's a fascinating insight. I haven't heard that before, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, by the way, tell us a little bit about your Jewish background. You know, you did not make a secret of the fact that you were a Jewish when you were on NPR, no. but I want to know who your parents were and where you were born and how you were raised as a Jew. Uh, well, my parents were both first-generation Americans whose, uh, whose parents came over from uh, the Pale of Settlement. Uh, my grandfather, the only grandparents I knew were my father's uh, uh, parents. And my grandfather was a tailor who came from uh, Tikatin to Cochin in, um, in Poland. Uh, but it was, all, it was all part of the Tsarist Empire. And my uh, uh, grandparents made it out around in the 1890s uh, and came over. Uh, my father was born in uh, on the Lower East Side and raised in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. His name was Joseph Siegel. Okay. My mother's family uh, came from uh, Vilna, I think. I think my grandfather came from Vilna. And they came to New York and then headed for the Catskills uh, long before uh, it became that much associated with Jewish hotels in, in around the, just before the turn of the century. So my mother spent the first years of her life uh, the eighth of eight kids in a, in a one horse town, uh, you know, with the with swimming hole and the, you know, and uh, fishing and shooting and that sort of thing going on uh, in a town, I gather, that was known for, uh, uh, for horse thieving uh, was its main, main reputation. But what was her name? Her name was Joffe, uh, Edith Joffe. My parents both worked in the New York City public school system. Uh, They're both college educated. Um, my father's religious background was more traditional than my mother's, but my, my mother's family was traditional, but not that, um, not terribly pious. Um, we kept a kosher home until I was about 13, uh, really because my grandfather wouldn't have, have come uh, to eat in the house. He was, um, it was, uh, he kept strictly kosher. 
it was not something that my mother was very enthusiastic about. Uh, we were, we belonged uh, to a reform temple from the time that, uh, you know, that I, I could remember. I started nursery school at East End Temple in Lower Manhattan. Yes. Uh, before uh, I started kindergarten in public school. The first time that I, that I was a regular uh, synagogue goer was around uh, the year before and after my bar mitzvah when I would walk with my father to East End Temple. And yes. Remember it? Do, do I remember my bar mitzvah? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Shalach Lecha was, it was, uh, you know. Shalach my... Lecha. Shalach Lecha, yes. But you remember the event as a lovely event? Oh, absolutely, yes. It, it was extremely important to my parents. Uh, after my bar mitzvah, I was in a little class with Rav Soloff, a rabbi that we'd meet after services. And I, for the first time, after having spent four years, I guess, of Hebrew preparation, I learned a little bit about Hebrew as a language, not just as a you know, as, as a, a, a memorization exercise. Um, Your point is so well taken. It reflects something true about Jewish life. When you and I were growing up, you went to Hebrew school and you were taught to, and the words we used were read Hebrew. We did not learn how to read Hebrew. We learned how to pronounce yes, Hebrew. That's right. We had no idea what these words meant. And many parents had no idea and to this day, Robert, many Jews who daven or go to pray and they sit with a prayer book, they have an affection, an emotional affection for the words and the prayers and the music, but they don't know what it means. You know what I mean, and yeah. Hebrew is a language. And you're telling me you were lucky enough after becoming bar mitzvah. Yes, to spend a year. Yeah. It um, sounds like you had... A pretty strong Jewish identity. Yes, I had a very strong Jewish identity. I, um, where I grew up, uh, I grew up in Stuyvesant Town in Lower Manhattan, down on East Fourteenth Street, which um, was said to be one third Jewish, one third Catholic, and one third Protestant. It was by it, it had a rather shameful history. It, they barred blacks. They, the head of MetLife said uh, he didn't believe in, as he would say in 1946, uh, whites and Negroes living together. So we, we, but it was considered by New York standards to be relatively integrated that, that Jews and Irish lived in the same buildings or whatever. And um, we, we, we tended to self-segregate by school. So the public school that I went to was, um, was where most of the Jewish kids went. Uh, and so I, I never grew up with the feeling of being in, in a small minority. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't describe my, my life growing up. Okay. So in the arc of your professional life, mm -hmm. you were not shy about letting people know you were Jewish. And I'm just curious, as you look at the arc of your career, did the fact that you were Jewish ever was it ever a problem for you? Did you ever experience either anti-Semitism? Were you ever denied anything because you were a Jew? Um, well, I, I mean, I did have, uh, like a lot of, of uh, Jews and non-Jews in media, uh, in high-profile jobs, I did have the occasional crank call or, or anti-Semitic piece of mail that would come in from, uh, from some nutter, but... Um, Nothing, um, uh, nothing terribly harmful. I, I was following in the footsteps of Susan Stamberg, who, in addition to, to being a, a woman who was host of a national news program on radio, uh, not, not television, uh, also is a New York Jew and sounds very much like a New Yorker uh, and, and uh, would be presumed Jewish by most listeners, and and she also did, did, does the Hanukkah, you know, show every year or whatever, and then made no secret about it. So I wasn't, I was hardly breaking any new ground, although there were times when I felt that it would have, um, if we were co-hosting a program, it wouldn't make sense to have uh, three Jewish co-hosts, for example. That this this is a national network. We're you know we're, we're drawing on uh, journalists from all over the country and and with all kinds of backgrounds. So, um, but no, in no way was I unfairly held back uh, for 
uh, for being Jewish. But um, I, I always did a lot of interviews about uh, on, on Jewish themes. And um, uh, one of them uh, was resulted in my being um, asked to host the uh, uh, Navigating the New Abnormal for the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, because I the last Christmas that I worked, which was typically a, I worked on Christmas, I interviewed a, a, a rabbi, a Joshua Plout. He'd written a book about Jews, Christmas, and Chinese Chinese food. Yes. And uh, so I had I had Josh on uh, for that to talk about it. And um, Josh was Josh got tremendous feedback, uh, wonderful feedback about the interview. And a couple of years later, reminded me of our of our conversation and asked me if I would help the American Friends of Rabin yes. Medical Center. All right. So ultimately. Yeah. Your, you know, it isn't an, it isn't a, you know, a one-step process, but very soon after you leave Columbia and KCR, and you were there in 1968 with the bust, and you were on KCR again, you were a year behind me, and I had graduated Columbia the year before the bust, and Robert, I say to people all the time, 1968 was a, a year that divides people. Yeah. If you were in college before 68, you were one kind of college student. You were in college in 68 and on, you were a different kind of college student. Does that resonate with you at all? Yes. In fact, I remember I did a, uh, an interview with uh, Joe Biden. It was, kind of a, it was a Biden exit interview. And... Um, and my producer, who's uh, at the time, she's no, no longer at NPR, or I'm an editor actually, was a good deal younger than I, and she wanted me to ask uh, to to ask um, uh, Biden about um, uh, how divided things were. And Biden gave the answer that I would have given, which is, you know, this is not th this this kind of division, 2016, uh, is nothing compared to what 1968 was like. Uh, when we had um, huge protests, we had uh, uh, riots in, in American cities, uh, we had an unpopular war that was uh, underway, uh, we had assassinations of uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, and when the country really was, was, uh, was riven in half, and, um, and I, I, I told um, of Renita, my, my editor, that that would have been my answer uh, to that question. And, um, and I'd thought that pretty much until this year, I think I always felt that um, no matter how divided the country felt in 2018 or whatever, 2019, it wasn't quite the same since when, it wasn't like a year in which George Wallace uh, ran the, the best third party uh, presidential campaign that we've seen uh, in, in our lifetimes. Oh, you're and when, so uh, he wasn't running against affirmative action. He was a segregationist. Right. Uh, and, people, and people have a very short memory, Robert. Yeah, yeah. it was, a, it was a, a, a disturbing time. And um, uh, as I say, until 2020, I felt that that was, uh, for me, that was the high water mark of, of division and of, uh, of uh, a sense of, of instability about American life. 2020, I'm, I'm willing to give this year a, a comparable billing. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a mood that, that's, uh, that's a bit familiar to me. But um, 1968 at Columbia was, first of all, for me, it was a huge turning point. The, working at the radio station was a part of a, uh, it was a measure of my irresponsibility that I, I had I had entered Columbia having been quite a successful high school student, uh, but um, kind of uh, uh, lost my way, felt very depressed for much of the time that I was in college. And the radio station gave me a, uh, something to do instead of what I should have been doing, which was studying. And, and uh, in the spring of 68, suddenly, and we had, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I did serious journalism there, but I had, I'd been there uh, to, um, you know, to cover and record the uh, the uh, notorious uh, uh, fight that broke out in 1965, I guess, at the Naval ROTC uh, graduation ceremony on the steps of Lowe Library at Columbia. I anchored our coverage of, of that entire week. 
I went into it uh, thinking, well, here's this thing that I've enjoyed doing and that I like to do. And now uh, I have no idea if, if I didn't work at KCR, I had no idea what I would have done. I, I don't think I would have sat in a building. It just isn't in my, in my personality. I certainly wouldn't have counter protested and I probably would have gone home. Uh, but instead I had this thing to do. I had this service to provide. Yes. And um, by the end of that semester, I said, uh, this is what I want to do. This is, this is uh, if I could figure out a way to do this, instead of you know becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher, you know, uh, this is what I want to do. Lucky us. All right, um, so I was asking you, you didn't go directly from KCR to NPR. You no, 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 no. I ultimately want to know how you get to NPR. I get to NPR after a stretch at WRVR, the old radio station of the Riverside Church. Yes. Uh, which had gone commercial and news and information, very unsuccessfully commercial, but- What did you do there? I was the news director. I'd, I'd begun as a reporter and then a, 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 a show anchor and then the news director. And then it was sold one day. I should have gotten out of there a couple of years earlier. It was a inertia on my part. But a friend of mine, very dear friend, had gone down to Washington after graduating from law school. And, uh, and he had a classmate, or, or not a classmate, a contemporary from law school who had left the law. And this fellow, Robert Krolwich, uh, had become a journalist. And uh, he had uh, uh, been at Rolling Stone and at Pacifica uh, Radio. And um, he was part of this new thing that was starting up at NPR. He'd, uh, he was the editor there. And uh, my friend asked him, could you help my friend see? We, we had mutual friends who knew each other. And uh, Robert really brought me to NPR. I figured leaving New York was uh, a, uh, you know, it was my near death experience, I thought at the time. I, I figured it would take me about two years to get back to civilization, meaning New York. And um, that this Washington thing was just something uh, temporary. Yeah. Uh, oddly enough, what really sealed the deal was a couple of years later, after I was, in, I was the, I began as a newscaster and we were expanding so rapidly that every six months I'd get promoted. I was uh, the newscaster, then I became an editor, then I became the senior editor. And um, I came home one day and I told my wife, I said, Jane, um, I think now that I'm the senior editor, um, I think things are now going to be stable. Uh, that this, it's probably going to be, I, I don't think I'll be getting another promotion or another raise for a while. The things are slowing down a bit. And I think literally a week later, I came back and told her, they've asked me, do I want to go to work in London? Uh, and of course, everyone's reaction to that was, but NPR doesn't have any, you know, any foreign correspondence or right. bureaus. You know? And uh, well, the, the, the wonderful thing about NPR, this is a lesson for, for, for certainly anybody contemplating a, a, a career in journalism is that uh, you, can, uh, you can end up spending a lifetime working for a place that didn't exist when you, when you started out. It can be in a medium even that didn't exist when you, uh, when you started out. And in my case, the, the wonderful thing about getting to N NPR early was that uh, it, it had been around for about five years when I arrived. It was still um, very small, it, about 10 or 11 reporters uh, and uh, only one big daily program, all things considered. Uh, and uh, but it, the people who were running it had had very big ambitions for it. Everyone, I mean, they, sometimes there were different kinds of ambitions. But um, the, the feeling was, we want to turn this into something, in, into something bigger. And uh, we have great ambitions for the institution. And I was part of that when we were planning a morning program, morning edition. Uh, it was concluded by the various vice presidents that um, uh, we would need better, more and better uh, uh, overseas contributions from the BBC. And so I was offered a, uh, what became a dream job. Uh, would I like to go to London where I would be our, our editor of BBC material and also freelancers, I would, I would recruit reporters and I would do some reporting myself and I would liaise with the BBC on our many, uh, our relations with them. We, we ended up spending four years there. Uh, and uh, uh, I worked in a building, Bush House, it was the head of the external, uh, the home of the external services of BBC. 
uh, where there were a thousand people who spoke every language imaginable uh, doing, a, doing broadcasts around the world. Uh, I was in Radio Heaven, and with each year I did more and more reporting and um, loved London. It, 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 I had uh, life-changing experiences. Yes, yes. And that's really how you become part of what NPR was growing into. Yeah. By the way, did mm -hmm. you enjoy doing All Things Considered? Did I enjoy it? Enjoy it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, it, it really uh, connected with my uh, uh, chronically short attention span, which was uh, uh, when I was news director of NPR, which is a different story, I had to think in terms of nine months. We're going to plan a program right now, and I've got to, I'll have to take part in 15 meetings, and I'll have to convince 10 people to do things that they may not want to do, and uh, get the move. Get this person moved here. You you gave me credit for launching Weekend Edition. I was the I was the boss that that launched Weekend Edition. But I got some incredibly talented people in the right places to uh, to make that program work. So that uh, I I I um I did okay at that, but it 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 wasn't my my natural personality to be able to think about what's happening over a a year long horizon. But to be able to work in, uh, walk in the day, to have a four or five things that I've got to get done. Uh, maybe one is finish a reported story that I was working on for the past two years. Uh, perhaps another one was interviewing an author whose book I've just uh, finished reading and I've written up questions for it. Uh, maybe another one is bringing together uh, two people from uh, different sides of some argument and doing a thing with them. Studying up on each one very quickly, uh, going into the studio. Uh, the day ending with putting on a show, uh, the day, you know, the, the day ends with, um, uh, to me, it would feel to be in a newspaper and to see the paper roll off the presses. I know, I mean, I've heard dozens of my friends describe the, the joy of that when newspapers still rolled off presses. Uh, and, uh, but to me, it, it wouldn't be the same thing as our having a program that went on the air and we, we broadcast it. I liked that. I liked the show part of it. So, uh, for me, it was it it was a, a very good good fit, and I got to I mean I got to uh, read books mm -hmm. uh, and and then ask the author the questions that I had about the book after that. Um, I in many cases I would have read the book anyway, in some cases not. But um, uh, how how good a job is that? And I kept learning. It, all things considered, uh, was a continuation of my education through. Uh, through into my 70s. You created wonderful moments for people on All Things mm -hmm. Considered. Um, I want you to talk to me for one moment about where journalism, where you feel journalism is today. And you know, Fred Friendly, who was a giant yeah. in broadcast journalism, a giant. And there were standards then, and there were rules. And you learned those rules at Columbia School of Journalism. I don't mean you personally. Mm -hmm. They were taught and there was a line drawn between opinion and the reporting of fact or news stories. And that line was sacrosanct. And at one time you were not even permitted to use adjectives in a news story because adjectives tend to express opinion. You just use nouns, you told the story, and then you let the reader come to his own conclusions. And one of my favorite lines in the world, Robert, mm. is a line from Shimon Perez, who said, the news is something that tells you what to think about, not what to think. And you know, we have seen many studies now that show, except for the United States Congress, the media has the least credibility among the no. American people as a whole. There's a feeling, and it's true for Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, that objective journalism is a relic of the past, and that newspapers and cable news channels have lost the distinction between reporting, reporting and offering opinion or commentary, that news stories now reflect bias. You have lived through this entire period 
I want to know two things from you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel there has been a change over time? And what's your sense of this criticism of current journalism, which says that the distinction between news and opinion now has been blurred. And when you turn on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, or you go to NPR, you're getting a perspective on the news, not simply the news. What's your sense? Well, first of all, so many things have changed and, um, uh, and I would not say that they've all changed for the better. But there, there, to me, there are different things at work. Uh, there, there, are, there are several changes at work. And I will begin by saying that uh, when I retired and, and found myself being asked a lot about uh, journalism and my own work, I realized that uh, uh, very often we tend to invest the way things were when we were young, the, in our salad days, with the way things were uh, for a long time. Whereas the media are always changing, and um, the, uh, uh, the 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 news standards that we that we were taught, or that I was taught in journalism school, and and by a, any news director who'd be a, a boss and a mentor, uh, were uh, they were as you say sacrosanct. On the other hand, the typical New York City newsstand managed to sell. Uh, nine, eight or nine different daily newspapers uh, every day, which, uh, which represented uh, rather distinct points of view. Uh, you didn't, um, uh, you, could, you could pretty soon figure out the Hearst owned newspaper from, uh, uh, from the Herald Tribune. Or from yes, the but that's because there were op-ed pages. Well, the news, and the news stories did yeah. not have the kind of bias that we read now in news stories. There has been a, uh, a, a commercialization of bias, uh, which is epitomized by uh, Murdoch owned properties in uh, print and also at Fox News, uh, countered by MSNBC, which seems to be doing something similar. I don't put CNN in quite the same uh, uh, category. Um, and and then there has been, uh, well, that, that 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 I would say is somewhat limited. There are also lots and lots of smaller publications that that are um, uh, that are uh, willing to do reporting that is much more opinionated than it is than it is fact. In addition to that, there was something that was happening around the days when NPR was uh, was 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 born, and when New York Magazine uh, came into being. Uh, when Newsday on Long Island was uh, remade by Bill Moyers, uh, which was a desire to somehow humanize the delivery of the news. Uh, because frankly, uh, the, you know, a, a, a news broadcast that, that you and I grew up seeing when we were young uh, consisted of a series of reporters, uh, nearly all of them uh, male, nearly all of them uh, white, uh, 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 announcing into a microphone with the, the voice of God what the truth was. Uh, and um, uh, frankly, it was, a, it was an approach that uh, came apart, I think, in the very tumult of 1968 and that, and that uh, period, yeah. when it didn't seem to square with the society we were living in, uh, which was uh, by no means uh, so, uh, uh, well, was was much more divided than, than than believing in a single voice of authority. Uh, it was, of course, I think, also a failure of of the of the mainstream, as they would say, media, uh, to report on things that were going wrong in America or, or uh, things that America wasn't getting right around the world, which led to all kinds of reappraisals in newsrooms around the country. How do we humanize this thing? How do we connect with people? Or are young people never going to buy a newspaper, look at a TV news show, or listen to a, a program on the radio. So without, without the commercialization of bias, but just humanizing uh, the presentation of news, there is an inevitable, uh, an, an inevitable uh, uh, in the process of humanization, uh, 
subjectivization, if that's a word, of, of what's being done, because you're hearing it uh, through the voice of somebody who is, uh, whose, whose personality, uh, whose style of writing in the paper is, is idiosyncratic. It's not, um, I mean, we might say that a no adjective rule uh, reflected a, a some kind of uh, a journalistic fundamentalism, but it sure didn't make for interesting writing. Uh, you know, the, the Herald Tribune was the writer's paper in New York, and um, it, it, it had, uh, and, and the papers that, that merged to become it, had some, some great writers whose copy uh, could be uh, quite, quite florid. Uh, and, um, but I think that the desire to, to keep news uh, relevant to, to newer readers, younger readers, uh, more diverse readers, uh, led to a great deal more personalization of the telling of the, of the story. That's, that's something, that's one thing that, the next thing that happened that intensifies the problem. It sounds like this does not bother you. That part doesn't, I, I was part of it. I mean, I, 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 as I say, NPR, at a time when, when people might have denounced infotainment, NPR took the attitude that, um, you know, there's a lot more to a good newspaper than just the front page. There's, there's, uh, there are no puzzles, there are argue, cartoons. No one, no one would argue that. Right. And that's, that's what all things considered. Yeah. All, you know, when you say that writing without adjectives makes for dull writing, yeah. for years, this was the standard of the New York Times, the paper of record, the paper that everyone who was well-educated and intelligent read, and nobody said this is boring. And then they went to the op-ed page and they read well, diverse opinions. But well, the op-ed page didn't happen until you know the nineteen seventies or so. The op-ed page was part of the was part of the the revolution that I'm talking about. Um, uh, because until that time, you only read a New York Times official columnist in the New York Times. You read Arthur Croc in the New York Times. You read James Reston. Uh, the op-ed page was somewhat revolutionary when it happened. Uh, you're talking about an op-ed page where basically people who are not on staff also participate. Yes. But what, yes. I'm, saying, what I'm saying is, yes, I know. No. Understood. There was a difference between Reston yeah. and the front page story on the New York Times. Yes, uh, there was definitely a difference uh, between those. But what I would what I would add is, let me let me continue with the problem. The next problem is 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 uh, social media. Uh, when I was at NPR for the last decade or so, uh, people were very much encouraged to have a presence on Facebook or on uh, Twitter. And, and I, I resisted that. I, 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 I complied to the extent that I had to, but I, I didn't like it. Um, Good for you. Uh, because um, I, I thought that um, I could uh, re reveal my personal observations only if I censored them. I mean, which would, they wouldn't be my personal observation. What I had to say that was edited and that I stood by, I was on the air with, uh, and it had adjectives that I don't think it was, I, I don't think you have to. Uh, uh, you were not reporting news as news. You were doing features. Yeah. It, it was appropriate that you gave us color and even that you expressed who you were through your stories. That's not what I'm talking about. No, I know. I, I, I know, Mark. But, but um, uh, what I would say is that um, these things change from era to era. Uh, our, our expectations of what... Uh, I mean, I was kind of stunned to see a New York Times front page that led, that is the story on the, on the right-hand side to the top of the front page, with a news, a, a news analysis. Uh, I mean, it was marked as news analysis, but I, I'd never seen the paper lead the, the, the paper with something other than news uh, until that time. Uh, on the other hand, the New York Times is, uh, is uh, trying to figure out how it survives uh, through the century. And I think that there's a lot of new thinking about what goes where, and frankly, the, the internet has disaggregated the paper so that um, you may find opinion in a very particular part of the paper where you know where to look for it. But the truth is that our children aren't reading a newspaper. They're, they're not picking up a, a hard copy and going through it by and large. They're reading the paper disaggregated online. 
uh, where the opinion pieces and the news pieces uh, are are right next to each other, or uh, or they come up in the same search when you Google uh, that uh, that subject, they come up together. So um, that is that's not a purposeful uh, redefinition of what of, of what the news is, but um, I think that. Um, it contributes to the changes that, that we're living through. I think that the, 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 the last level of a problem that has, that has aggravated this has been the Trump presidency uh, in which um, I, I had been very unaccustomed to saying things like uh, the, uh, the president said this, this and uh, this has no evident basis in fact. Um, uh, this is, or this despite evidence you know, overwhelming evidence to the contrary is what the president said. Uh, the president, who is always the most reported on person in the in a, a, a U.S. news organization's output, uh, the president turned the journalistic statement that he, the president, falsely claims the following uh, into into solid reporting. Uh, that that unfortunately is a daily sentence uh, that that people have written during the Trump era. Uh, and it, it, it is very, it's a terrible burden for, for journalists because uh, it sounds like they're dumping all over the president and calling him a liar. And the reason for that is he has a, ten, a very serious problem about lying. Uh, and um, we can try to avoid that. We can say some people are offended, so we shouldn't say that. But um, when, you, when you claim uh, that the reason that the number of uh, COVID cases uh, uh, is increasing in the country is simply because of increased testing, uh, when in fact hospitalizations are up, which is a, a leading indicator that deaths will be up uh, right after that. Uh, when we started out with this strange business of the size of his inaugural crowd, which is uh, uh, not only talking to a city full of people who've seen every inaugural crowd, uh, but also, you know, aerial photography from the previous uh, uh, inaugurations. Uh, the the news media found themselves in this very peculiar situation of reporting on a president who said things like no other president we've ever had, and uh, there are a great many people who, for their own reasons, will back him up, uh, will stand by him, which therefore now creates an issue of imbalance. Why don't we have somebody coming on to say that? the uh, 2020 election actually was unfair. Uh, and there's a good case to be made that uh, a Trump victory was stolen from him because uh, X number of, of, of uh, people in leading positions and X number of millions of people in the country believe that. Well, uh, good fact-based journalism in the best tradition of Friendly and Morrow and in the best traditions of, uh, of uh, David Halberstam uh, find themselves or have found themselves in the Trump era, at least, uh, reporting that the, the president has a, has a serious problem about lying to the American people and uh, does it quite often. And we haven't had that before. We've had presidents who reporters might uh, uh, personally like or dislike and, and, and they might surprise you who they are. Uh, we've had presidents whom people might agree with politically or disagree with politically, but we haven't had this. This has been something uh, utterly novel for uh, for the news media to deal with. And um, some organizations have decided to uh, abandon uh, any, you know, any traditional stance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, not caring about the outcome of a political conflict. Uh, I, th I think NPR has kept its head. I think the Washington Post has kept its head very well and done a great deal of breakthrough reporting at the same time. Uh, okay. But okay. it's tough. Yeah. I am very surprised by your comment. You can't think of other presidents who have lied, not only have lied, yeah. but have lied over issues which are of magnitudes more important than whether you say you had the largest crowd at your inauguration. A, a lie, a lie that, that there was a massive criminal conspiracy throughout the United States to distort the, the election results of 2020, that the numbers you see on those 
pretty straight network news shows. The Fox unit that calls the races is going by the same rules as the CBS and the ABC and the NBC. Absolutely. And uh, to 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 spread the information and and expect it to be treated with with dignity and respect, that there was massive coordinated fraud throughout the United States, and that's the only reason uh, that Donald Trump didn't win the presidency. Is, as I say, it, it, it wasn't the first lie that he's told. It's a dangerous By lie. Way, which is a worst lie for the American people? There was a conspiracy that caused me to lose the election, which is what Trump is bas basically, he hasn't used, I'm not sure he's used those exact words, but that's certainly the sense we're getting from his. Yeah. Okay. Is that worse or less serious than Donald Trump is a Russian collaborating agent? First of all, only one of those lies is told it, by the president of the United words, States. The lie we were told and it was told by news sources, which at the moment you were defending. That lie right. should take away credibility from every news source that did. The New York Times won a Pulitzer for a story which turned out to be a lie. Is it a lie mm -hmm. to say that Benghazi was a spontaneous event when we know not only do we know it wasn't, we know that the people who said it was, including the president of the United States, knew it wasn't. Is that it's a lie that the Iranian government was moving towards some kind of moderation. And that's why the Iran deal made sense. And it turned out that Obama's no, the, own no. Obama's own National Security Advisor said it was a lie, but we needed to bamboozle the American people. A lie to me is when you know it's false and yeah. you say it anyway. Well, uh, a lie, a lie then is FDR saying that we weren't going to enter the Second World War in, in, in when he ran in 1940. He's may, lying may, at that may, time. May, if, and, he, and he artfully is bringing the country around to support for entering the war and, and remaining in support against I Germany. That, I don't oh wait. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think that all lies are equal, but I think that um, to me, uh, Mark, why is the president undermining the country's faith in its own election system and something which Americans across America, across the country do, they go and they sit and they poll watch and they register people. Uh, and they, they then count the votes. It is democracy at work, and it is being mocked right now by the sitting president of the United States. And well, that's it serious. No, it was no less mocked after he won. The entire it, system, it was mocked. We were told it wasn't legitimate. Yeah, I, it, and I, I believe, and I just had this conversation with... Uh, uh, with E.J. Dion on the air the other day, that this is, we're having several presidencies in a row that begin with questions of legitimacy. Right. Uh, tr Donald Trump, Donald Trump's birther conspiracy uh, is, it was a, a, a complete fabrication, an, an utter lie, unless you feel he's so dim that he actually believed it. Of course. Uh, and, and a very racist one also. Of course. Quite, was, quite. Know, how was it racist? It, it was, it, it was assuming that, um, uh, Obama, by virtue of his uh, uh, background, was a constitutional fraud. Okay, uh, and that, that was Donald Trump. That was Donald it, Trump. Oh, it, it turned out to be silly. It was silly. The question it was is, believed. It was believed by tens here, of millions of people. The question here is not whether it was silly. Yeah. The question is whether we call it a lie. It wasn't a lie. Trump and the other people, Trump believed it. A lie is when you know something and you tell people the other. I am glad we have an Affordable Care Act, uh -huh. but I'm not happy the way we got it. And there were lies told to the American people in order to get it. I don't, I don't want to live. And by the way, they were told by Barack Obama. Uh -huh. Those were lies. You mean that and you it, could keep your doctor if you like him? And that, by the way, is like, I, don't, I believe that is not a lie. Because uh -huh. I believe I, I believe, believe that's a lie. I believe Obama believed it. It turns out he was wrong. There's yeah. a difference between wrong 
and lying. Yeah. Obama was wrong, but it wasn't a lie. There are many instances where Trump is wrong, but a lie has a venality to it. And it begins by knowing the truth and telling something other. Benghazi is an example of a lie. I, I, I thought Benghazi was, uh, was a case of uh, first reports coming out, uh, being blended with the Cairo reports that had come out at the same time, uh, and uh, uh, talking points uh, that uh, uh, were um, uh, inaccurate. Uh, and I don't, I don't think Susan Rice was especially lying or Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton answered Hillary questions Clinton, about Benghazi oh, oh, oh. Uh, for, for Hillary I, I, I watched, I watched Hillary Clinton's questioning before uh, uh, the oversight uh, committee. And um, I, I, I've never seen Donald Trump face questioning of that sort of his, of his statements. And I think he never will uh, agree to be questioned. And I think that one measure of someone's lying or not lying is are they willing to be questioned on it or not and grilled on it? Well, there are times when, there are times when Hillary Clinton has not wanted to answer questions. And I'm gonna say this again. He, yeah. I assume you know that Hillary Clinton wrote an email to her daughter the night of Benghazi in which she says to Chelsea exactly what happened. So she knew what happened. And when she then bought into this idea that there was about a video and Robert, somebody went to j this video guy went yeah. to jail in America because of a lie told by the administration. That's a lie to, to well, say I, that there is a larger crowd than there. I, that's I think, not, Mark, just... Mark, I think that you're, you're uh, I mean, obviously these things are very important to you. I think that you are overlooking the damage that the lying of Donald Trump has done to our democracy. He's not lying. He's not lying about the election? He's not lying about no. that? No. No, he, you think, it, if, and then do you think? I, I, I don't think he's lying any more than I think Obama was lying when he says you like your doctor, keep your doctor. Uh, I, I, I do believe, first of all, uh, that when you uh, decide to campaign against our democracy, when you decide uh, right. to are challenge in the courts, to delay the counting- Are we talking about Democrats here or Republicans? No, I'm talking about Donald Trump right well, now. Well, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I'm old enough to remember when I absolutely wanted Al Gore to, del to delay election results until the Supreme Court ultimately came out with a ruling. And that was until December, I think December 13th. Didn't yeah. bother me a whit. No, but the only thing that, that was at issue in the, in, the, uh, in the Gore case was a recount in one state where no, there what? was a balance of 500 votes. Yes, and by, the, and by the way, why wait till December? Because that's the way the system works. There's law here. The law is yeah. that if, if, if a candidate loses, yeah. He has every right. No, actually, that's not true. Mark. It's not true. There are different laws in every state. In Florida, if the vote is within 1%, there's an automatic recount. It's not up for a I'm candidate. For to I'm only saying that any president, any candidate who loses, whether it's Hillary Clinton who loses or Donald Trump who loses or Barack Obama, it doesn't matter. They have, if it's Al Gore who but loses. Why, why, why have, have we Obama. never had, why have we, uh, have we never had multi-state litigations going on with uh, Rudy Giuliani in Pennsylvania and the county commissioners in Wayne County, Michigan, and the uh, calls from the two Georgia senators for the Secretary of State, the Republican, to resign because of massive fraud. When, what's the precedent for that? I don't know why precedent is relevant here. There's nothing typical about the last four years. You said that, and you're right. And by the way, don't misunderstand me. Yeah. I'm not giving, I'm not whitewashing Trump. What I'm saying is I want to criticize Trump for what Trump should be criticized for. And I've heard ad hominem criticisms of Trump that just seem to flood the airways. But but, you know, but, I, but this is, I, but this I, is I, the kind I, of I, dilemma I, that I, journalists I, have. I, this I, is I, the I, kind I, of dilemma that journalists have. You say that the ad hominem, I mean, 
nobody has introduced Nazi. more ad hominem criticisms into our national life than, than not, Donald Trump. He is not uh, a Nazi. Who said he's a Nazi? Well, Christina Ampura just had to apologize on CNN. I, but the, who, Demo the Democratic Party read an ad in which they basically said Donald Trump was like gearing. And if I'm telling you something you don't know. Yeah, I don't know okay. that. Okay. I don't know that. I'll tell you how you don't know. Like everybody else in America today, and I'm not, this is not a criticism. This is a description. You have your sources of news, which you trust and you go to. And if they don't include it, you don't know it. And that's a problem for the American people as a whole. Donald Trump has been an aberration. He never should have been elected. He wasn't trained to be elected. And you and I probably would agree why he got elected in uh, 2016. Okay, and by the way, he's about to leave office. On January 20th, one way or the other, we're gonna have a Biden-Harris administration. The other thing that will be is, in, instead of a civil handoff of power in which a president says, even though George W. Bush lost the popular vote and, uh, and we think that maybe if they'd had one more recount, uh, we might have pulled it out, he's the president of the United States. We have lunch together at the White House, ride down Pennsylvania Avenue to get into the Congress and we demonstrate the continuity of government in the United States. Unlike uh, Barack Obama, who was stunned by Donald Trump's election in 2016, uh, and whose administration uh, ran the, the kind of transition that George W. Bush had, had provided to them to help them get started, and had the Trumps over to lunch, and they rode together in the limousine, and they showed that, after all, we're all Americans, the presidency, uh, the legitimacy of our government depends on public trust and how the Constitution is followed. Instead of all of that, what we're seeing is a, a personal tantrum uh, that is going on. Now, maybe, maybe all that will change, uh, but I'm personally, not speaking as a journalist, speaking as a citizen right now, I'm appalled at how few people have spoken out and said, you know, the United States faced with a pandemic, uh, with a challenge that was screwing up one primary after another in places that barely got coverage, Washington, D.C., could hardly organize an election uh, uh, this year uh, because of, of the number of polling places that were closed. The Maryland primary was a catastrophe. We were looking towards a disaster. The American people and secretaries of state of both parties and uh, county election officials all across America figured out ways to make sure that we could all vote. And they pulled it off. Uh, and that was a democratic act. And it is under constant attack right now from the president of the United States, who is going to lead a movement based on the notion that he was robbed and that honest citizens of America did not see their will worked. There is no friendly uh, and civil handoff of government. Uh, this is, this is a good, good versus evil. That's okay, what it so, like. so I, I will make my prediction. Yeah, okay. And then you and I can talk about it at the yeah. end of January. Okay. By January 20th, this will be worked out. Donald Trump will host Biden for whatever traditional lunch there is. They will ride together in the limousine together. Mm -hmm. And Trump will hand off power identically to every president before him. Implying and, and saying he is the legitimate president of the by United States. By the way, I don't understand this. I have heard for four years Hillary Clinton says she's, she got robbed. I hear not only did she get robbed, but Stacey Abrams got robbed in Atlanta, although she lost by 50,000 votes. This is now what politics is. And for somebody to say it's only Donald Trump, to me is myopic. There is hypocrisy everywhere. I feel, and I think, and the American people feel that the amount of political hypocrisy that now exists is has eroded more confidence in Congress than any other institution, even the media. 
Yeah. I think what you're saying is a is a is a, some people believe this. Um, uh, I would say that um, uh, I you know I mentioned the curtain raising lie on the size of an inaugural, which is a fact. That's what we're that's what we not travel. A lie. No, it was a lie. It it's was not a lie. lie. It's because not. he he thought it was bigger. You're you're now adopting a worldview where no, if the not, if the no. king if the king feels something, it must be true. No. No. By the way, it's a lie is when you really know something is not true. COVID-19 is like the flu. It will disappear. Well, that's... We'll be back by April. Fauci, Fauci yeah. told us it was not as serious as the flu. No. Everybody Let's, got it wrong. You have Donald Trump talking with Bob Woodward, saying what he's been briefed at that time. And it's totally contrary to what he's telling people to do when he's saying reopen, reopen states. Uh, when he makes a fetish out okay. of not wearing a mask. Okay, okay, so there are- that, That's our health and welfare. So there are, by the way, there are mistakes the man makes, and these mistakes may be why he was voted out of office. Well, good, that's called America. You don't like what the president does, vote him out. It's not about a lie, it's not, he's a liar. By the way, his argument was, yeah. That he was referring to all the people who were watching, including those on TV. Do I think it's a, do I think it's a lie? Oh, do, I oh. think it, do I think it's silly? Do I think it's a certain kind of childishness? Yes. But it's not a venal lie. A venal lie is Benghazi. That's well, a lie. Great, I, 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 I don't see um, the, a, a phenomenal difference in Benghazi. Uh, Benghazi, the the Times reporter who did the first, you know, who did actual reporting on Benghazi uh, or, or Kirk, Kirkpatrick, I think, to me that was the straightest story I, I got, and it was and it was straight in, in, in being a rather confused story of what. what I want happened. you. To, I want you to go back. You can find Hillary's yeah. email. Look at what he yeah, but Look I, at what she I, said to, to. To my mind, Hillary Clinton <laughs> lost the election. Hillary Clinton is somebody who did not get elected president, and I don't think. I mean. I'm sure she has all the sore feelings of anybody who lost, uh, but it's not. Um, uh, she 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 didn't do what she's what's happening right now. She won the popular vote. She told Biden, yeah, under no it's not not to concede. Yeah, that's. Concede. I mean, what what? By the way, that's lunacy. But it's also part well, of. Con I argue it's part yeah. of contemporary politics. Yeah, it's a larger problem than Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And I'll say it again, he's, he's done, he's gone. And it's, and- No, he's not, he's not. Yeah, he, is. he has Rudy Giuliani is in court uh, to, try to, to try to make sure that he stays in office. He has every right to do that. He'll try, he'll fail. You know, you yeah, I, I know he, he, he will he, fail. He will, he will fail. fail. I think he'll probably screw up the, uh, uh, the transition uh, 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 pretty well. And what I do think he'll really do is Leave a political movement that's that's a revanchist movement in this country. Well, we had one for four years and we've lived with that. Nah. But do I believe there was revenge from the Democratic Party for the last four years? Absolutely. Absolutely. My point isn't to defend the Democratic Party over the past four years. My, my, my problem is, is how to deal with the presidency and how the news media dealt with the presidency of Donald Trump. And I think that... Uh, it was unlike anything. You, you may feel that it's it's one of a piece with uh, with Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton, who was never president. Um, I mean, I think uh, the truth is the difference between policy and truthfulness is is not uh, uh, it's 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 not clear cut. I do not believe, for example, that George W. Bush was lying about uh, weapons programs in Iraq, but I think that he proceeded to make the worst mistake of any president in, in, in recent times. I hope you're right. Based on faulty intelligence. I hope you're I hope he and Colin Powell didn't know that what they were telling us wasn't true. I want to believe you. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that sense. Colin Powell, unlike other members of that administration, has apologized for, for his presentation to the Correct. United Nations. Right. And he's explained, and I, I we, we he and I had this conversation in public, and he said it many other places, I think that uh, there was a, a uh, I, I believe there was a sincere belief in the intelligence 
uh, that was coming out of the uh, out of the intelligence community. I hope I you're think right. It was the worst the worst decision that I can think of any yes. contemporary president having made. So lying wasn't required there. Right. Um, I agree. Uh, and and I I think that these different decisions that you make, how you describe what happened at Benghazi, how you describe what the Affordable Care Act will do, uh, I, I I think that there are, there are hierarchies here. And I happen to place uh, confidence in American democratic society and in uh, confidence in how we elect people and why we respect people of both parties uh, and we respect the peaceful and normal transition of power. And uh, at this moment, uh, you're very upbeat about it. Uh, I, I, I'm, um, we don't need to raise a generation that's cynical about the electoral process. I agree with you, but this and that views our country the way uh, the way Putin would, would would view our country. Cynicism began when Donald Trump won. Democrats really, really couldn't ever accept it, and that is what has undermined democracy. And that's what's what's you know. And it's interesting. I listen now to some of the things that Joe Biden says. And Joe Biden is now talking about bringing manufacturing jobs to America. And he's talking about, no, he's not gonna ban fracking. And yes, he wants everybody to buy USA. Well, those were things Trump was saying when they weren't being said by any Democrat. And he was hammered for it, hammered. I, I don't think he was hammered. I think he was, he was opposed politically by politicians because they all supported the, what was called the Washington Consensus. And yes, he has, he has changed that. He hasn't, he hasn't created that many manufacturing jobs and we've turned our most productive sector that really made out like bandits from these trade deals, our, our farmers who, who did beautifully by our trade policies, uh, we've turned them into recipients of federal aid, which is kind of strange uh, because of, of, of the new China policies. But I, th I think Trump uh, won on those, on, on, those, on those issues. He won on, on immigration and he won on trade policy that had let American business uh, flee the country and everything else. And I, I'm, I'm personally, I've expressed my impatience very often with democratic friends who want to uh, make deus ex machina explanations for the election result of 2016 when there were real political old fashioned arguments and some uh, some cultural arguments i mean the, it's it's not clear how many uh, how many people were being displaced from their jobs by mexican immigrants but the the, the caricature of everybody coming up north uh, from from mexico as a criminal and a rapist i thought was uh, appealing to some of our baser instincts but that having been said there also are times when immigration uh, is unsettling to people. And we're now at a stage where there's a very, very high proportion of foreign born and Trump played on people's anxieties about that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think that's why he was elected president. And many of the things that he has said and done along the way uh, that have been, uh, that have undermined civil society and, and democratic discourse were unnecessary. He could have been elected and decided, you know, I'm a minority president. I'd, I, I should really try to expand uh, uh, how I relate to how many people in America. Uh, and uh, in, in, instead uh, took a very strange combative attitude uh, toward them. And um, yes, people think politicians are phony uh, and that they're all, a, they're all a bunch of fakes. But there's, there's a certain amount of of uh, civility that keeps us from uh, from from being in civil war, uh, that keeps us from from being a country riven by hatred, uh, and most politicians, uh, John McCain certainly, uh, when he saw the uh, 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 people when somebody stood up and described Obama as a Muslim to him, he corrected that woman at that moment. Mike Castle, the congressman from Delaware, who was a a, a Republican and a, a, a great legislator corrected somebody at, at, at a rally uh, that uh, no, you know, he's he's a good man. I just disagree with him. Speaking of Obama, 
uh, the unfortunately right now the, the word is in that that kind of behavior makes you a loser. And uh, uh, Trump is a man who is raised uh, and has lived his whole life uh, uh, being a hard guy who won't be a loser. Uh, there are there are losers and there are winners. Uh, POW is a loser. You know, uh, a um, a person with a billion dollars is a winner. Uh, and and that attitude, I think, has been corrosive. And um, I think that um, to ignore the damage uh, that that uh, this this individual has done is uh, uh, that's not good journalism. That's not good journalism. Let's see if um, get this straight, because I was with you all the way. Yeah. But are you saying that if someone disagrees with you, it's not good journalism? No, I'm saying to to ignore uh, the ignore. what. The question is, what does it mean? Are, are you surrounded by people who you knew four years ago? They were lovely. They're not so lovely anymore. You, in other words, you've experienced what you've described because I haven't. I have I experienced. I, I have experienced people yeah. who think Donald Trump is a joke and they understand clearly the things you said about him and they don't romanticize him. Even those who support him can list many of the things you said with no trouble at all. But they haven't changed. They're not meaner. They're not, when you say corrosive, it, he, he, in many ways, is a buffoon. You and I agree. There were many reasons he was elected. You didn't mention mm. that America really wanted somebody who wasn't a politician. And so they, this was a protest vote. And I expected him, I expected the Democratic Party to come back with a strong, moderate candidate who would just walk into the White House. It didn't happen because in the last four years, if anything, the Democratic Party has had to deal more and more with the progressive left. However, people who don't like Trump or those who do, they only like his policy. Nobody ever says a word about him nice in terms of his demeanor or how he handles himself. And nobody ever, I don't hear anybody argue, yeah. here's a guy who was schooled and prepared to be president. But for you to say, mm. it's corrosive, and if I don't agree with you, it's not good journalism. I find that to be, I don't think that's, I don't think you want to say that. I think that there are, uh, uh, there are things like character uh, and honor uh, that, uh, uh, and um, uh, empathy with other human beings. I think these are values that matter in a national leader. Our system depends on a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of people doing things that they're not required to do. The law is what keeps us, you know, those of us who are not in prison from becoming members of the prison population. Uh, but but our our culture our system uh, uh, keeps us a civil society that uh, you know you disagree in and you don't talk politics about with everybody we get along and we uh, we we all do our jobs and I think that um, yes that I think that there has been a corrosive uh, impact on that and it's um, I think that you are so minimizing uh, character with the word style uh, you are. Uh, defining the personal leadership of, of, of the president as something that is apart from substance, that is, that is inseparable from substance. And I, I defy you to go, go back, listen to, you know, listen to a Churchill speech, uh, listen to an FDR fireside chat from the Great Depression, and tell me that um, there's no element of respect or honor or a sense of responsibility uh, a, a, a sense of, of, of empathy for others uh, that you're hearing from that speaker that is essential to their leadership and that defines what kind of country they're leading. And my answer to you is this, and this is this also is the is part of the nub of the problem for me, and it's and I gather it's not for you, and that's okay. If you were to hear some of the speeches that Donald Trump gave 
in Barack Obama's voice. They're some of the el most eloquent things that have been said by a president. And most of the time, most of the time, Donald Trump speaks like any other president, sometimes very beautifully, but it's not Barack Obama's voice. And no matter what he says, we're told what to think about it. And I believe that what you call, what really bothers you, and I respect what bothers you, and I know you mean it profoundly and honestly, that you feel that, that over the last four years, there has been a degradation of American life because of the man who op occupied the White House for four years. And I'm saying- Of American political and civil life. Uh, you know, I, uh, that's, that's, that's I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that everybody is necessarily poorer because of Donald Trump uh, uh, or whatever. Anyway, I, I, my own feeling is I'm critical of Donald Trump for a whole host of things, but I will not, I will not succumb to what I believe is a, a mob mentality here that is in fact led by a media which from day one couldn't believe that the people of the United States through an electoral college, which now they want to change, elected Donald Trump. Well, all I'm saying is uh, that um, the, the idea of the fact uh, as having some, a, 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 something that one aspires to, uh, that, that, you, that you try to present a factual picture of what's going on to, you, to the people, is, is a measure, uh, we should think that as a normal measure of a leader in a democratic society. And, uh, and I believe instead what we've had in the past years, which has been very difficult to report on because inevitably you sound like you have it in for the president. Uh, but when sources of expertise have been at odds with the, with the president, uh, the experts go and the president stays. And, uh, uh, and you're, you know, the fact that, that um, uh, whatever quote you pull out of Fauci, Fauci can speak for himself. We've also all, all lived through this right now. This year has been a catastrophe. And how we, how we turned uh, mask wearing into a, a, a politically cultural symbol is, is, is that, I, that I lay right at the doorstep of the president. Nobody else did that. And uh, it's, it, it has not been, literally, it has not been healthy for us. Nobody got it right anywhere on the planet earth it would probably i i would probably think that if there had been a uh, a a a very uh, much stronger response uh, to the pandemic at the beginning uh or in 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 march uh instead of seeing this straight away and and it's it's not just donald trump there there's a tendency in american life uh to um regard everything as a conflict between rights. And, and so the right not to, to wear a mask became an important right. But I, I think we could have fewer than 250,000 dead right now if we, had been, uh, uh, if, if we hadn't turned this into an argument over freedom to, uh, uh, to congregate. And um, if the president had encouraged public health measures instead of belittling it and saying that it was a very small problem, I think Fauci uh, turned around pretty quickly after saying that it was a a, a flu, and there are ways in which it's like a flu, right? Uh, but um, but uh, you do agree with me. Nobody got it right. Whether everybody got it right, that that's that's not um, the question we should be asking of our officials: is Did you get it as right as you could have gotten it, or did you did, did you get it wrong? And um, and I think that um, uh, there's been there has been a totally unnecessary uh, argument over reopening as a point of freedom as opposed to a matter of public health. Well, I agree with you on, on the substance of what you've just said. I, I, I like, maybe it comes with living in Washington for all these years. I, I'm, I, I'm very proud of my country. Uh, and, uh, and when I have reason not to be proud of my country, I find it disturbing. 
And um, this notion of, um, of, of, of the great fraudulent election that was wrought, people, people should be able to leave office uh, as, as a wonderful county commissioner from Cobb County, Georgia said, uh, when um, the vote in his, in his county was impugned, we should be able to leave with grace. Said, and he congratulated the, for the woman on the board who had just defeated him for county chair. And he, and he congratulated and thanked all the people who had done such a difficult job of, uh, of uh, conducting their election. Uh, that's, that, sh that should be the sentiment after this past election that we had. And uh, alas, uh, uh, it's, it is, uh, you would say, it's a fault of style. And uh, I also think it's a fault of four years. I think the acrimony of the last four years also infected the system. And that's not Trump. That's, that is a, a media and a Democratic Party that told America Trump stole the election with the help of the Russians in collusion with the Russians. And they have been, by the way, they have been mer merciless. Uh, I, I don't think that um, being president is ever all that easy. Uh, and I think that um, having a, th a, a thick skin, you say we, the country chose someone who wasn't a politician, uh, but uh, I, I, I think that it's a position of leadership where you, you have to be able to, to, to take a punch once, once in a while without not just punching back, but, but, but kneeing the other guy in the groin. Uh, and, uh, and that style, uh, um, uh, you know, which many people I think accurately, I mean, from what I've read, the books that I've read, uh, it's, it's, it's a Roy Cohn approach to politics and it's not an honorable approach to politics. Uh, and, um, and it hasn't been an honorable time for us in, in, in the country. I, I would be uh, disappointed to learn that a generation of American school children have come up thinking, well, what a, what a, what a good way to be. What a, you know, what a, that's, that's the kind of, you know, uh, uh, tell it like it is straightforward guy that, uh, you know, that I'd, I'd like to grow up to be. Um, I, I, I think we'd be a lesser country for that, frankly. Well, again, although we don't see it the same way. We don't. We, we don't, don't see it, but in many ways we do. We don't see it down, down the line the same way. I think the last comment you made is very, is profound about how, what we would like school children to mm -hmm. think about. What I don't agree with you about is that because someone speaks well, doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't really dishonest and mean and destructive. And I think that there were many things that Barack Obama did and nobody was as eloquent in my lifetime. And I lived through Kennedy. Obama was the single, is, he remains, the single most eloquent orator in America. And yet some of the things he did, I find to be, for me, I know it's not you, mm -hmm. much more serious than what you think Donald Trump did. And I don't believe, and, and by the way, I promise you, I will tell you, if it turns out that I can, I see I'm wrong, I'll, I have no trouble saying to you, I was wrong. But if, but I do not believe school children are gonna be any less than what they would have been four years ago because of Donald Trump's presidency. And now he's gone. And we have somebody who seems to be, I don't know if he's gonna be a good president or not, but he may be a wonderful president. And I, and I hope Joe Biden is as wonderful in the next four years as some of the things at one point when I was very enthusiastic about him. But regardless of how effective his presidency will be, it will be a very different tone, a very different style. I'll come back to the earlier point. I think we ought to be congratulating the people who ran the 2020 election, 
who are in 51 jurisdictions and a gazillion counties right. and pull this thing off and it make me feel good about being an American and seeing our civic life being lived at the grassroots, regardless of who is sitting in the White House. Uh, but it, it would be nice to, to, to say a good word for, for that genuine act of democracy, which, which is what gives me confidence in the country, that it's, it's built into us. I love you. You are, <laughs> you, you are one of a kind. You are brilliant. And I, I love you, even if I disagree with you at times. Yeah, yeah. I love your sensibilities. I love your sense of passion. And your passion is for the things that are good for other people. And look, you spent your life elevating us. That's what you have done. So you have to know, not only on a personal level, on a professional level, I am so honored that you, Robert Siegel, are now doing a program on JBS. I wish you only, you know, kol tuva hatzlacha, you should have only success in every endeavor that you enter. And I hope you have health, long life, and that when this COVID is over, you and I will get to continue our discussion in person. In person. Well, thank Mark, first of all, Mark Golub, thank you very much for inviting me on, on L'Chaim, uh, uh, but also for putting the uh, Navigating the New Abnormal on JBS. Uh, I feel very honored by that. Uh, it's, it's very nice to see you, even if, if uh, you know, as we now see one another yes. during this pandemic year. Uh, and uh, as you noted at the very beginning, we, we, we first met, uh, it's now over 50 years ago, yes. uh, as, as undergraduates at Columbia, both working at the radio station. So it's good to talk with you, and, uh, and I, I appreciate your, uh, uh, your, your insights and your arguments, and, um, and uh, even those which I disagree with. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's been fun talking. I have enormous regard for you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. The thoughts of Robert Siegel, the longtime co-host of NPR's All Things Considered. And he can now be seen hosting his own series right here on JBS, Navigating the New Abnormal. I hope you have enjoyed getting to know Robert and that you'll make a special point of watching his series on JBS. And thank you to Rabbi Joshua Plout executive director of the American Friends of the Rabin Medical Center for producing Robert Siegel's Navigating the New Abnormal. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. You can email me or you can write me. And remember, you can also listen to the L'Chaim podcast, which you can download wherever you download your podcasts. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. To life! We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.